Welcome again to our First Friday Forum for the month of March. Hard to believe it's March already. Uh, I'm Dave Gass, and I'm chair of the Business Advocacy Committee and uh, of the Chamber of Commerce, which is uh, responsible for organizing our First Friday Forums. So like usual, we have some announcements before I bring up our speakers today. Uh, first, I just would like to announce the uh, um, upcoming First Friday Forums uh, next month. Uh, which is April 13th. We're we, one week a, a later because of Good Friday being on, on April um, um, 5th, 6th, I mean. So, is Good Friday, is it April 6th? It must be, yeah. No, no, yeah, it is, yeah, okay. <laughs> that makes sense, why, why we move it? Uh, so, April 13th will be our first Friday forum in April, and that's going to spotlight economic development and we will have um, um, Patrick Drynan of the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corp. Um, and we'll have, I think, Chad Peleshek of the City of Sheboygan, uh, Don Pullman from the uh, City of Plymouth, and probably one or two others who will just talk about sort of economic development in Sheboygan County. So again, another interesting program. They'll kind of bring us up to speed on where things are, where things are going. In uh, May, um, we don't have our speaker format lined up, but what we're organizing, we're working on organizing, is really a forum that's going to focus on sort of energy. And we're, the, what we're trying to put together, and we don't have it all together yet, but we will, uh, is to have a forum that will sort of talk about all of the energy sources out there and have someone who can maybe kind of separate the myth from reality. It's a little bit of a different forum than we've done in the past, and I think it'd be interesting. Everybody has a lot of questions about, you know, energy and all the conjecture about energy independence and what we should be doing. And so we're going to see if we can bring some individuals in who can talk about sort of the facts and, you know, where, where we could really go putting aside all the rhetoric that's spewed out by uh, political uh, people. Um, <laughs> yeah. On a national level, <laughs> uh, not state, national. So. And Mike, that was a good segue into our June First Friday f Forum, which is our legislators, our state legislators will be back at that time, three months from now, to give us an update on um, things state-wise. So um, again, those are always interesting. And then July, we take a break. We take. Uh, July off, and then we'll come back. We've got a set of programs where we're planning, but it's a little bit premature to talk about them right now, but they'll be good. Uh, I would like to also, um, uh, again, reiterate, uh, we thank Prevea Health and Wellness for being our sponsor. They were last year, and they agreed to do it again this year, so we thank them very much for being a sponsor of our first Friday Forum. The other thing I'd like to mention is um, um, I think every one of our First Friday forums um, um, we've had taped and replayed on our local public television, and uh, that is WSES, and that's Channel 990. Um, and I want to thank WSES and Steve, who has been very diligent about coming and, and taping our shows, our First Friday forums. And it will be replayed probably next week, Steve, and maybe sometime after that, so you'll have to consult the format. And Betsy? I was going to say that now I've discovered you can go to their website and you can actually replay them. So if you know people who wanted to come and can't, we'll be putting it on our site too. Yeah. It's WSDS, you're going to Yeah. Okay. So they are recorded and kept there now, so you don't have to wait to see them on your set or if you don't have that particular cable. Great, great. So we again, we thank WSDS. It's a good, <laughs> um, a good, uh, uh, service that they provide for us and being able to get this information. Um, the upcoming um, March 14th, we have a business after hours at the Kohler Spas, which has um, become very popular. So uh, if you are at all interested, call in quickly. Go to the website. Go to the website. Yeah. Um, maybe just a comment on. Um, for any of you attended, for any of you who didn't attend the chamber annual dinner, um, maybe c congratulations to the chamber staff for organizing what I thought, and I think most people agree, was a very well organized annual dinner of about 500 people were there 
and I think I was commenting to Betsy before our meal is, you know, when you think about uh, bringing 500 people in, um, serving them cocktails, getting them in down, sitting down to eat, having a program and giving out awards, and you're done at 9, 10, that's pretty amazing. So congratulations to the chamber staff and all those helped organize it. And at that, uh, at the annual dinner, you may have noticed it was pointed out, the slogan, Better Together. And I think you're going to see that more and more. And that, that is, I think a lot of that's resonated with a lot of people. And I think it does signify, again, what the chamber is all about is that, you know, as a team, we accomplish a whole lot more together than we could as individuals. So um, I believe that's all the comments I have. So with, oh yeah, we'll forget that. So uh, our, our topic today is, are our legislators and um, uh, let me introduce them and them up. And uh, they're gonna speak, uh, we've asked them maybe to highlight in some short comments sort of the committee work that they're doing or you know, the significant aspects of their current committee work as well as legislative things we're working on. And then we're gonna really open it up and wanna reserve enough time to open up for questions and answers. So don't be shy in asking your questions. This is, they, they really do wanna hear your questions and be able to respond to that. I mean, they look for feedback from all of us as you know, the constituents. So um, um, think of your questions as they're giving their general comments. So um, we have, I think, four of our uh, legislative leaders here today. And um, we have Senator Joel Leipom, Representative Mike Ensley, Representative Dan Lemahieu, and Representative Steve Castell. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna do it on the stage. Um, you, you, you do have your musical act prepared, right? Yeah. We didn't tell you about that? Oh, okay. Um, we're gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we do have a karaoke machine downstairs we could bring up. Uh, so they're gonna speak from the stage and then I think Maybe we'll let uh, Senator Leipom go first, give the Senate perspective, and then the representatives can decide how they want to uh, go in their order. And then after that, then we'll have uh, comments. The mic is on, so um, everything should be uh, set to go. So gentlemen, if you'd like to come on stage. Well, thank you, Dave, and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you to provide you with another update on things that have been happening in your Wisconsin State Legislature. I think I can speak uh, comfortably on behalf of all my colleagues that we really do enjoy these opportunities to keep you informed as to the actions and the events and activities that we are participating in down at the State Capitol. And it has been a very busy and I believe productive legislative session. We began our session back in January of 2011 and we function in two-year periods down at the Capitol. Our 11-12 legislative session is coming to a bit of a close over the next couple of weeks. Um, and we look forward to talking with you about the issues that we're working on. What I provided for you today is a update on what I think are some of the highlights of the recent legislative session. The trifold piece that should be in the center of your table identifies what I would again call key legislative actions that have been taken by the legislature between January 2011 and December of 2011. So most of the items in this document have been adopted in both houses of the legislature and our law in the state of Wisconsin. And I detail that in each uh, item that I address. I'll, I'll, I'll give the status, but most of this reflects kind of business that's been completed and has become law. It focuses a lot on working to balance our budget, uh, to force our state to live within its means, to uh, reform the way in which we administer and manage our governments, not only at the state level, but at the local level, and at efforts to grow our economy and our job base, our private sector job base in Wisconsin. The one page sheet is just a, a quick update on bills that have moved through the state Senate since January of 2012. So this is kind of our winter floor period and the 20 or so bills that I list there are kind of key or highlight issues that I would suggest have made their way through the Senate. Many of them are over in the assembly 
um, being considered and, and we'll move on uh, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. So I hope you read through that and, and learn a little bit about some of the specific things we've done or that we're working on. Um, I serve on a number of different committees. I think collectively you can be proud of the fact that the five legislators that represent parts of Sheboygan County are on most if not all of the key committees uh, in the legislature and your county, our county, has a real strong voice and influence in what's happening in, in most legislative matters. The chamber provided you with a listing of all our committee subjects. The key committee that I uh, chair and have been focusing on is our Committee on Economic Development, Jobs, Veterans, and Military Affairs. And that's really what my focus will be for the next couple of weeks as, again, our legislative session uh, begins to come to a close. And we've got a couple of areas uh, on the economic side of uh, things that we continue to work on. We are hoping and working to try to find yet an opportunity in which we can uh, make additional angel seed or risk capital available in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, this is something that we've done in the past. I think back in 2006, we adopted an angel investment uh, tax credit program. We'd like to build on that and enhance on that. Uh, Wisconsin, unfortunately, lags behind every other state in the nation in regard to the amount of government taxpayer support that we put into angel seed or upstart kind of company opportunities. We're working to find some opportunity there, but we're also trying to be fiscally responsible. I mean, we want to keep our budget balanced, and tax credits or incentives to businesses get counted as costs in the way we do our uh, budgeting down at the state capitol. And so we're trying to find what we can responsibly do to help some new startup businesses while being respectful to our budget balancing goals. But I'm hopeful we're going to find some answer yet uh, on that important angel seed investment area. We're also working on the Senate side, and I think the Assembly will uh, concur with us, to expand an economic development opportunity that runs currently through the Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Authority, WIDA. WIDA, um, in many people's minds, focus on housing situations, but they're also a very strong economic development partner in the state of Wisconsin as well. Over the past 20 years, uh, WIDA, working with private banks, have invested over $170 million in small business opportunities and assistance programs, and they haven't ever had a loss uh, with that $170 million investment. And so I believe that there's an opportunity there for us to give WIDA some additional flexibility to work with more smaller businesses and more geographical diverse businesses across the state. And I have a, a bill in the Senate and, a, and it's uh, sponsored in the Assembly as well that would make some additional economic development opportunities available through WIDA. And then finally, uh, we continue in our committee to work on the veterans, uh, veterans issues. And really our key focus there right now is that over the next couple of months, we're going to have thousands of Wisconsin citizens returning because of the uh, stopping of activity in Iraq and uh, changes in Afghanistan. A lot of our military folks are coming home. And we want to make sure that these folks come home to Wisconsin, find jobs, and then stay here in Wisconsin. And so we've got a couple of bills that would do some simple things, like uh, a military serviceman or woman may um, use their skill and their talent to be a, uh, a health safety officer within the military to do health issues. We believe that what they've learned and what they've experienced on the health side in the military should equal or equate to the training or the requirement that they would need for a certification to become an EMT in Wisconsin. And instead of having to go through a whole separate certification process when they return, to get their state certification for an EMT, why don't we allow them to use their military experience to meet that training requirement? So it's a simple change that we're gonna make, but it really, again, will help these individuals get into work-based opportunities they, when they return home. Those are some of the job-related focuses. Obviously, I can't neglect the biggest job issue that is kind of lingering over the Capitol at this time, and that's the mining permitting uh, bill that uh, the Assembly has passed and the Senate, I hope, uh, will pass and we'll be able to get a bill signed into law. What we're looking at doing, again, collectively as a, as a state, is streamlining and improving the process in which an applicant and their applicant would go through to be able to get a permit to mine in Wisconsin. We're not approving a mine permit. 
That's going to be up to the DNR, the Army Engineers, and the EPA. What we've learned is that currently in Wisconsin, we basically have a moratorium on mining. The way our laws are written, it basically makes it impossible and infeasible for any company to want to consider mining in Wisconsin. There's a huge opportunity in northern Wisconsin, perhaps in other parts of the state. And what we're working on is trying to find ways to, again, make the process of going about getting a permit a little bit more streamlined and efficient. The Assembly passed a bill. They can talk more about that if they'd like. In the Senate, we're struggling. Um, one of our Republican members is not yet on board with a even amended version of the Assembly bill. And there's not a Senate Democrat yet that's willing to step forward to support any type of a proposal that would help to bring this type of a mine, mining operation to Wisconsin. We'll be meeting in finance on Monday, and our hope is that the uh, finance committee is going to be able to find an answer uh, uh, and, uh, and hopefully get a, a mining bill moved forward. The other thing that I should mention, because again, um, we're going to be raked over the coals uh, for this issue as we have on most over the past year. I mean, there's all these different levels of approvals that are there to protect our environment. I have a huge amount of respect for our Department of Natural Resources. They are not, even with an ease permitting process, they're not going to just rubber stamp a permit. They have the responsibility and the respect through their, through their requirement of their job to ensure that if a permit is brought forward, that environmental protections are in place and that we are having safeguards in place for our environment. And then again, it goes beyond the DNR, it goes to the uh, Corps of Engineers and the EPA. And above all that, to talk about this, in our Constitution, we have what's called the public trust doctrine in Wisconsin. And we, the citizens of Wisconsin, have said, you know, we, we value and respect our environment. And we're going to build into our Constitution that nothing can, can violate the, the trust and the, the respect that we have for our environment. And so, you know, even if we tweak the timelines a little bit and, you know, change some of the processing, any permit still has to meet that constitutional muster of being, again, in line with our environmental values here in the state of Wisconsin. I'm hopeful, again, we can maintain those environmental standards while recognizing that we've got to, in Wisconsin, start to move forward on some job opportunities and economic opportunities that are key and pertinent to our state. Um, as manufacturing continues to get uh, harder and harder to do here in Wisconsin, other jobs are, are more of a struggle. We've got to build off of those things that can build jobs in Wisconsin, and this mining opportunity is one of those things. If we turn this down, we're turning down really, I think, an important economic and industry aspect of Wisconsin that we really should be, again, in smart and environmentally sensitive ways, working and taking advantage of instead of neglecting. So that's um, my update, and I know the representatives will have even more good information to share, and then we do really look forward to your questions and your input. Thank you very much. Oh, they're going to take three team. There you go. So it takes three of us to replace them. <laughs> Joe gave a very uh, energetic and, and positive report and, and uh, I like that but I when I tell you that it's very good to be back in Sheboygan County looking at all of you believe me when I tell you that um, it's been a, it's been an interesting session and in some ways challenging in many ways very very rewarding um, we've we've accomplished more and I, I can say this with uh, complete confidence we've accomplished more in this session than I think in the in the the 10 prior sessions combined. It's been that dramatic. Uh, and, and not everyone's happy with what we've accomplished, but it's my belief that what we've done up to this point is very positive and is going to help Wisconsin position itself to be a national leader in economic development, in, uh, in, in uh, economic in, uh, environment in general, and fiscal stability, which is is really what our job is, is to manage the, the state's resources on your behalf and to, to, to find a way to provide the services within available resources. And that's not been done so well over the last uh, long time. And, and we're, we've, we've turned things around to the point where we have a manageable situation that we can feel good about. 
<clears throat> I've had the opportunity to do some interesting work in the legislature over the years. Uh, this year I am, uh, I serve on a number of committees. I serve on the Children and Families Committee, which in the past I've, I've chaired for a number of years. I serve on the Insurance Committee, and then the uh, uh, Criminal Justice and Corrections Committee, and I chair the Education Committee. It's been an interesting and fun time, sometimes challenging uh, time to, to, to be chairing that Education Committee because there's a lot going on. But when we talk about exciting stuff, um, it's, it's there. I mean, we, we're, we've, been, we've been working on, on issues that have really just been kind of uh, talked about in idle conversation uh, over the years. Um, beyond all of the, the drama that you've heard about, there's some less dramatic um, or uh, headline-grabbing things that have gone on that can have dramatic effect. And on on the the, uh, the future of our education system and the future of the opportunities that we we can provide kids in Wisconsin, over the course of of uh, the last <clears throat> twelve months, there were some major efforts that were ongoing. The first one that started was actually uh, generaled by Tony Evers, who's the superintendent of public instruction in Wisconsin, originally from Sheboygan County, and. Uh, he, he headed up a group working on, on a, a task force uh, looking for ways to evaluate educators, teachers, principals, uh, to create a system that everybody could agree on um, to, that we're going to evaluate educators in a consistent way across Wisconsin. For the first time ever, that evaluation is going to be um, going to rely partially on student performance. That's going to be a, a, a centerpiece, not the whole, the whole pie, but it's going to be a major part of the evaluation system, student performance. Not raw test scores, but student performance measured over a period of time, something uh, the, the, the technology today allows us to create growth models that, uh, that can measure how well students do from one year to the next. That's that's some, some neat stuff. The other part that was going on, um, the governor came to and talked to the, the uh, committee chairs, the education committee chairs about eight months ago and asked how we could uh, start a conversation about, about reading in Wisconsin. The concern being, of course, that um, when, and the, the governor used the phrase that up until third grade you're learning to read and after that you're reading to learn. I don't, I don't know if that exactly wraps everything up uh, in, a, in a nice package, but the fact is if, if young people um, get into, um, the, get past the first few years of their education and not learn to read, life is going to be very difficult for them and their odds of being successful down the road get less and less with every day. So the governor wanted to focus as much as energy as possible on um, we're taking a look at what can we do, what can we do differently to help make sure kids have the best opportunity to learn to read. That was, that was a long-term task force that, that uh, met quite a few times and it included the representatives from all the different education uh, areas around Wisconsin, all the different disciplines, including uh, representatives from business and, and uh, the education community, along with, with some of us legislators. And we, we came up with a package in the end that we think will, um, not immediately, but will have a, a major effect. And what it amounted to is what everybody could agree on is that the most important thing uh, to a classroom is the teacher. So we, we're going to make some changes that will ensure that when you, young teachers are, or young folks are going to schools of teacher preparation, that they're actually getting the tools they need to be able to walk into a classroom and and be successful, and uh, we found that that isn't necessarily the case right now. So we, there will be some changes that'll that'll change that'll have an impact on that. And then we're also going to evaluate kindergarten kids. I mean, we're just going to screen kindergarten kids across the state in a consistent way to find out who needs extra help. Those two things sound simple, but but getting it done and and uh, looking at what the impact can be and what it has been in other states is just tremendous. 
So we're pretty excited about that. The other part is there was a long-term task force, again, that was, it was chaired by the governor, uh, Tony Evers, myself, and uh, Senator Olson, the chair of the Senate committee, um, looking at, at school accountability. How can we measure uh, and uh, consistently across the state all the different education programs in a fair way using the, the best technology available? That um, you can imagine having 25 people in a room coming agreeing on how that should be done is not the easiest thing to do to come to that agreement. But I think we did come to some pretty good agreements, and most of that is now represented in the the waiver application that the the Department of Public Instruction has forwarded to uh, the state or the the national uh, Department of Education asking for a, to allow us to implement our own accountability system instead of the federal No Child Left Behind. And the Obama administration is entertaining those waivers and we're hopeful that, that that'll be successful. The, the biggest thing that, that everybody should keep in mind is that when we talk about public education, um, it really isn't, um, we don't do schools just to do schools. We don't. We don't spend lots of money just because we have to. The whole idea is that we want to create the best opportunities possible for the, the children of Wisconsin so that they can be successful later in life, so Wisconsin can be successful. The buzzwords that you'll hear over and over and over again is the new buzz phrase is uh, we want them to be college and career ready. What that boils down to is we just want them to have the, the to be prepared and to have the tools to be able to take the next step. Before they can do that, they've got to graduate from high school. They've got to be able to read and write. They've got to be able to do that proficiently. We in Wisconsin for years have kind of sat on our laurels. We have this notion that we're just good, that we do education really well. And I would say that there's a lot of truth to that and we're very fortunate in this part of the world, in this part of the state. I think you can, you, if you can go anywhere in Sheboygan County and find good results for your kids in the public schools we have here. But as a state, we have been falling further and further behind the rest of the country. That's not even talking about how far we've been falling apart some other parts of the world, falling behind some other parts of the world. That's, it's not a good thing, and I think we've not, uh, not had that difficult conversation for a long time, that we're having it now and actually taking steps to make a difference is a good thing. Uh, I, and what we'll find along the way, there will be some resistance to change. Change is, is hard to do sometimes, uh, especially if you've been doing it the same way for a long time. But it's, it's, it's vital that we not try to protect the status quo and just do it as we've always done them before, because in that case we would fail. I could rattle on about this for a long time, um, and so I'm, and I know other a couple other guys. Are thinking, so, but I, I'll be I'll look forward to questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. Fourteen months into this now, so I am now a veteran. Yeah, right. Um, if you want to talk about committees? Um, I'll just preface my comments first by just saying. Um, based on the previous occupation that I had before I ran for office, I was well aware of what was happening in Wisconsin, as I'm sure all of you are as well. And that is the fact that we were no longer being competitive from a uh, economic standpoint and from a business standpoint. Um, in my view, um, excess taxation, litigation, uh, additional regulations that have been piled onto the businesses have made it more difficult for you to do your business and to make money and to employ people. When I received my committee assignments, um, I was chosen as the vice chair of the Jobs, Economy, and Small Business uh, Committee. I knew that was going to be a, a pretty major deal because of what was in front of us and the reforms that we were looking to, to put in place. Um, didn't have a very good feel on transportation, which I also sit on the Transportation Committee, and Ways and Means. Little did I know, and again, I don't have a whole lot to compare it to, but um, it, it was uh, a daunting uh, task because uh, especially here in the last few months as we're kind of winding down our session. Um, maybe for my veteran colleagues who have been through that before, um, they're probably used to that. I, I happen to, I assume that even 
this session it's probably even a little bit more ramped up just because some other things are going to be happening in the next few months that I think have pushed things forward even faster. So it is, it is, uh, it is um, an arduous task to actually get some of these LRBs and get some of these proposed bills and co-sponsorships and, and do your homework and study both sides of all the issues so that you can uh, hopefully make an intelligent uh, uh, choice on whether to support a bill or to vote for a bill. Um, the one thing I want to mention is just some, some real brief statistics um, regarding the current 2011-2012 uh, session. Um, by the end of the session, I'm speaking for the assembly only, um, by the end of the session the assembly will have been on the floor for more days than each of the last two uh, previous legislative sessions. Uh, there were 20 session days in 2007, nine session days in 2008 for a total of 29. In the 2009-2010 year, uh, there were 25 session days in 2009, six session days in 2010, so a total of 31. Um, as it stands right now, with much more yet to go, um, the 2011-2012 session has had 29 session days in 2011, uh, four session days in 2012, <coughs> with a few more to go yet, so we'll be probably in the, the mid-30s as far as session days. I, I think there's been some media publicity that, you know, that things just aren't, uh, you know, we're, we're not in session as much as we should be, but we've, we've done more. Bipartisanship. Um, despite some of the claims, again, that, that there's been so much division within, uh, within the, uh, the, two, um, the two parties, um, this year, let's see, 96% of, of all roll call votes this year included uh, Democrat, Democrat or and independent votes. Uh, 110 roll calls have been taken in the assembly so far this session. 68 out of the 110 roll calls, or 62%, have had 66 or more votes. 106 of the 110 roll call votes, again 96%, have had at least one, if not two Dems or independent votes, uh, along with the majority. So again, even though sometimes you, a, a picture is painted a certain way, there has been a lot of support. And when you take the floor sessions and compare them to the committee sessions, it's even significantly better than that. Um, for me, as I mentioned before, the jobs committee was the big one, um, just because of what we needed to do, and that was to create jobs. Um, some of the some of the, the, the biggest bills, as, as Senator Lightbomb had mentioned, is mining. Um, it, for me, it's very frustrating. Uh, again, being the vice chair of the jobs committee, I said in all of the hearings that we had, the, the three major uh, public hearings that we had up in Hurley and and uh, also in uh, both in Madison as well as in Milwaukee. Um, I think if you add in the hours that um, our committee has met, both in our formal committee group as well as in our subgroups, I'm sure we're hundreds and hundreds of hours total. Um, I won't make any comment about, about the, the current status with, with it kind of being held up by one person, but for me it is very, very frustrating because I did spend a lot of time up in the Hurley Iron, Iron County area, and if you haven't been up there, it is sad. Um, it is a ghost town. And as you drive through that town, there's nothing there. All the storefronts are boarded up. I think the number that I heard when I was up there was that in the last five to 10 years, they've averaged about 49 or 51 um, high school graduates from Hurley High School. Last year, they had nine. And that's just simply because people are leaving to try to find work. Um, I have been involved in the intimate details of the mining bill, and there is not one issue that anybody can say to me that will justify no one voting for these jobs for those people up there and for the thousands of other jobs that will be all throughout Wisconsin. I believe this is the biggest uh, economic job initiative bill that we've had in this state for many, many decades, and it's very frustrating. Um, the people need the help, and those jobs are there. Any issue that somebody has, based on the hundreds of hours I've been involved in this, we've heard them all. Any environmental issue, there are things in place today that will take care of those types of issues. Whether we're talking polluting the groundwater or what have you, there are, there are things that are in place to address those. There's a reason why Wisconsin hasn't been in the mining business for a long, long time while our partners, Michigan and Minnesota, have been. When you factor in the new technology, there's even more things we now have in our, in our toolbox, if you will, to address some of those issues. Just to give you one example, there is, um, and I don't know all the terms of the various pieces of equipment, but for lack of a better term, they have these little mini wells, if you will, that are going to go down into the ground. 
and I'm talking on day one, before any permit is ever, is ever awarded. And if there's some things in that, in that groundwater table that come up, the, there's alarms and there's bells that go off, and these types of systems are designed to notify the DNR and the EPA and all the people that are going to be monitoring all this stuff immediately. And then there are corrective actions in place to address those things way, way before it's ever producing iron ore that's going to be hauled out in trucks. Now, again, I, I don't want to be partisan, but I, I have to tell you, the bottom line here, there's not one, our friends across the aisle, there's not one of them that is for this bill. Not one. And I think it's absolutely a shame. We, according to Senator Leipold, you know, we, we are still, you know, fighting the battle. Um, but if we don't get this bill, it is going to be really unfortunate. <clears throat> what we're doing right now in Wisconsin, in Madison, and I think uh, Representative Castell mentioned this, and I'm sure most of you know this, what we're doing is not rocket science. We started off with reforms to not spend more money than, than we have. And we all know what's happening in Washington. We know what's happening in just about every other state in the country. So we, we started to put forth reforms to address these things. Unfortunately, the, the, the umbrella, the federal umbrella, and what's going on in Washington, D.C. kind of casts a little pale over that. So it kind of limits us to properly position Wisconsin so that when some of those other changes take place, we're going to be ready to rock. And we're starting that process right now. I will end by just saying that, as Senator Leipold had mentioned, we really appreciate the opportunities to talk to you in these types of uh, uh, events. And by all means, if you have issues, please let us know. Um, I could go on. I, I tried to, to whittle down my list of all the bills that have gone through and have been act enacted in law. Every single one of these is addressing either some of those reforms, tort, you know, tort reform to address a lot of the litigation issues that have been doing nothing but making it difficult for businesses to operate. Um, obviously, a lot of different budget repair bills and things like that. We're just beginning, but everybody in this country is watching us right now regardless of whether it's things like mining or whether it's things that are affecting our budgeting, uh, our budgeting everybody's watching us. And, and I firmly believe that if we can get to the next point on, on our map of reforming state government, you will see the rest of these states, a lot of the states in this country are going to be following suit. With all the stuff that's happened over the last 14 months, yeah, people are kind of sitting with wobbled knees a little bit and a little concerned of what's going to happen. But if we can continue our reform agenda, we will be starting a lot of really, really good things to get this country back to where it needs to be. Thank you. Sixty seconds. Okay. And you can, yeah. and you, and you can clock me. I serve on uh, Joint Committee on Finance and Joint Committee for Review of Administrative Rules. I serve with Senator Live and Senator Grothman on those committees. I think we've done uh, yeoman's work trying to reel in some of the administrative rules that have been uh, oppressive to businesses around the state. And, and obviously our budget speaks for itself. One of the questions, and I'll, I'll end with this, one of the questions I've heard more lately than anything else is when are you guys going to change the way we do recalls in Wisconsin? We, and, and I mean, people are frustrated, and, and I could use a lot of other words that I won't use today about that whole process. But we have a, we have a it's in the Constitution uh, how we do, do this, so we, we need a constitutional amendment. We have one in front of us in the Assembly on Tuesday that will change that uh, you can only recall an elected official for uh, after they, if they commit a crime or if they uh, there's probable cause that they violated a rule, uh, ethics rules in the, in the state of Wisconsin. So that, so that there's a reason. Right now you don't have to have a reason. Um, it's hard when you're the party that's being recalled to change the recall rules. Uh, this, one, this won't change anything that's happening right now, even though we'll be accused of trying to do that. But it's time that we um, allow elections to stand and only use recalls for what they're meant to be. And uh, so we have that constitutional amendment. We'd have to pass both houses in the next two weeks. And then next session uh, in January, uh, starting in January of 2013, and then a statewide referendum. Hopefully we can get something like that going so that uh, we don't have to go through this mess uh, again. Thank you. OK, let's have some questions and answers. Um, Mike, you want to ask your first question? Um, our businesses are affected by some of the pollution rules that are coming out from the federal government. And Mike, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the non-attainment status for Sheboygan 
the county. I know it's not good news, but I think we should know about it. It's one of those one of those moments where you just have to like, oh, are you kidding me? I think it was Wednesday, Wednesday of this week. Um, I was in a meeting and found out that the the dual stage vacuum system that's on all the gas dispensers, the gas pumps that, that suck away the vapors because that is putting ozone into the air. You know, the EPA and their illustrious wisdom has now figured out that it actually makes the environment worse. The two competing vacuum systems actually make more, more ozone go into the, in, into the air. So they're now allowing us and allowing the gas stations and things to, to not have to put those in anymore. Within an hour after that meeting, I had another meeting with, um, with uh, uh, Representative Lemmy and Costello as well um, with the DNR, Wisconsin DNR, and this one was with regard again to the ozone non-attainment standards, the, the little monitor that's out on the, the, the lake shore, if you will, that monitors pollution. I should have brought the map because you'd all get a laugh at it, but when you look at where the monitoring system is for Sheboygan, on, out of Terry Andre, right near the water, all the pollution just comes up Lake Michigan. This year, just last week, we were notified that Sheboygan County now will be the worst, the only one that is no longer within the, 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 the requirements, if you will. The only one. Meaning even downtown Milwaukee, where the monitors are, has better air quality than we do. If you look at the map on where the monitor is located, it's, the stuff is just blowing up the, uh, blowing up the coast. And when you factor in the humidity and things based on the water, I mean, that's what's driving those numbers up. The, the folks from the Wisconsin DNR did not really try to deflect our, our views on that. Um, my concern is, could have an impact on economic development because it does cost some of the big businesses, especially when they're putting some things into the air and there's a cost to that. And, and if we're the only one left, we even talked to them about going a handful of miles inland. You could maybe go into Oostburg or, or, or somewhere. Hang on. Put in the, that is a good place. Put in the same exact monitoring system, and if you look at all of the ratings and all the different locations throughout the state, we would probably go from 87 or whatever that number is down into the 60s, which means we're perfectly safe. Unfortunately, the, the EPA, you have to have five years of having of being in the attainment group five straight years of that before they will allow you to move a monitor. So how do we get out of that? <laughs> we, we really don't. So if, if Manitowoc or Ozaukee County or whatever, and if they're going to start putting together brochures and pamphlets on how great their area is for business and try to attract some new businesses, I think that little black mark we're going to have on our, on our sheet is not a good thing. So we're going to, we're going to contact our, our uh, congressional delegation with some letters and things and see if we can get some support from, um, from Senator Johnson and, and, uh, and the rest, but um, it, it's just, just crazy. Yes? I got a question. If, you have, if it takes five years to move a monitor, what would it take to make another monitor go up there? I mean, could we have more than one monitor? And we finally had, I think, the first honest conversation about that in years. This, this measurement system and the location of the monitor has been, uh, it's a long-term issue. And I believe, from what, what we've been told, is that the, the, site, the sighting of the, the original sighting of the monitors was somewhat optional for the DNR at the time they were done. The phrase I used in the meeting the other day is that the folks at that time with the DNR were true believers. And uh, they could have just as well worked at the EPA as they, as they did at the DNR. So they weren't trying particularly to be helpful. They were literally trying to create bad science, and they were successful in that regard. Um, what I, and I asked, we have started the conversation about maybe moving another one in. It wouldn't take much, but let's get it in, into the, uh, a few miles away from the lake to show what the uh, measurement should be. And uh, we'll see how that, where we go with that. We're going to do what we can, but it's, it's not a good situation right now. They, we're just kind of stuck. Let's move on to the next question, because we're, we're going to run out of time, unfortunately. Uh, who had an, uh, Ed?
behind this bill? No. So why aren't they? I think basically it's because they don't want to give a win to Scott Walker. That's exactly wow. that, that's what this is all about. This isn't about jobs. This isn't about the environment. This is about giving a win to Scott Walker during a recall election. Thank you for being up. Uh, who can I ask you to follow up? Who's the senator who's uh, voting on the Republican side who's going to vote against this? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can't you all know the name Dale Schultz? <laughs> Maybe some letters might be appropriate. Well, I had to, to the work? Democratic members mm -hmm. of the Senate who specifically represent the communities mm -hmm. in which the mine would be located. Uh, none of them are on board in support of the bill. And in Milwaukee, where thousands of hundreds of jobs uh, to mine equipment manufacturing companies, none of them are working with us either. I mean, they, the 16 of them have once again basically checked out on the issue, and they're a no vote. And so we're trying to find uh, the answer that we need in a package that can get the 17 votes in the Senate. I, I remain confident. I'm, I'm ready to vote, as I have already in the Finance Committee for the uh, Assembly Bill. But I think on Monday, we'll make some tweaks in finance that uh, meet most of the objective uh, concerns that Senator Schultz has raised, and I'm hopeful that um, he will realize that um, he shouldn't be standing in the way of this important economic opportunity, and that you know jobs and people are part of the environment as well. Next question, Randy. You guys, you guys have any read in terms of, of how the state is doing in rebounding from the recession, the revenue, is the revenue stream improving? I mean, where are we, where are we going in the next budget session in terms of our, of our, uh, our sales forecasts? And maybe when you answer that, Joe, and others, um, maybe could you comment, you know, there's been a lot of press about, especially on our side, about um, Walker's job numbers were actually, uh, we have worse unemployment than the rest of the country and things were going worse and worse and worse. Could you include an answer to that comment? Sure. First on the, on the budget situation, I mean, we are eight months into our two-year state budget. It's the 11-13 uh, state budget. Uh, it's a budget for that, for the first time in 12 years, was actually balanced and had everything moved forward as we had hoped when we passed the budget, we would have been looking at a surplus, actually, for the first time in 15 years, of about $100 million. Um, all of our budgets are based off of estimates that come forward to us from what's called the Legislative Fiscal Bureau. They're professional people that look at national forecasts and state forecasts on revenue and expenditures. Um, a couple of months ago or weeks ago, they you know, gave us a little bit of a warning saying, you know, the economy isn't going as well as we had estimated back when you guys passed the budget in June or July. Um, we think it's gonna pick up, but we just wanna give you a warning that it's looking right now where you could be about a percentage off on revenue, and that equates to about uh, 160 to $200 million or something like that. Um, I think it's great that they gave us that warning because it uh, disciplined the Republicans in the legislature even further to not be passing any bills that would spend any money. I think since the budget's passed, we've probably only agreed to spend like less than a million bucks, which is unbelievably disciplined for a legislature. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really is. Um, in the grand scheme of the fact that we're dealing with a $66 billion you know, budget every two years. But those, that discipline is also then impacting, like I said, trying to find money for this angel seed investment. You know, we could do things in the past. We could say, well, let's just, borrow another 60 million bucks or something like that and put that into angel seed or let's just take 60 million and, and put it on the deficit at the two years. We're not going to do that. The only thing that we're going to do is if there's some cash that we think is legitimately available, we'll put that into investments that we think are wise. Uh, so we're, we're on track. I think all of us would wish the economy was going better than it was. Um, and you all can be a part of that, obviously. Assumption and, and employing people is a key part of that. But overall, we're doing well. I mean, we've created, or you have created, um, close to 40,000 new jobs in the state since January. Uh, in comparison, the two years prior to that, we lost 150,000 private sector jobs. So um, it's not at the number that we'd like, but we're actually gaining jobs in Wisconsin now instead of losing. Again, 35,000 plus in comparison to 150 negative. Um, I think the other good thing uh, to talk about is that, again, for uh, like we all had always been in Wisconsin, we now have more manufacturing jobs in Wisconsin than government jobs. If you remember last uh, 
in the prior last two years of the last administration for the first time in our state's history we had government jobs exceed manufacturing jobs in wisconsin and we've turned that back to the right perspective uh, so those are i think some good positive things obviously we want to keep growing the economy Dan. i think the the important thing is as senator levin said the fact that we have this early warning on on a potential Shortfall, and this is, is this a shortfall in revenues, not a shortfall, or not because we're spending more money or because, because our budget's out of control. It's, it's a short on revenues, on projected revenues. We have a year and a half, basically, to, to deal with that. Now, if we, would have, if we don't do anything, a year from now, we've got some serious problems, because then we have to find that 100, 100 plus million dollars in six months. Well, the shorter time you have to, to find that, the more problems you have. So, so if, if we're disciplined, if we uh, deal with our agencies as we should, as a finance committee and as an administration, uh, we can deal with that. It, it's 1%. It's, it's something we can deal with uh, as long as it doesn't get out of hand. Hopefully, the economy will, will continue to improve and, and those numbers will change. But uh, it's, it's because of the revenue. It's not because of, of, of a spending problem that we have. Um, One thing that I think doesn't uh, doesn't quite go through all of the communications that go on in the media is the the intention that medical assistant the medical assistance programming is putting on the state budget. Um, it's really kind of taken over the spot. It, it was always K twelve education before, but the pressure for the last uh, twenty four months has been coming from medical assistance cost increases. There, there's a lot of um, time spent talking about cuts to medical assistance that, that the governor and legislature have done. Truth is, the last budget put in what, about 1.8? 1.2 billion more just into, into uh, medical assistance programming, and yet it's not keeping up with the increases. So we're going to do everything we can to make those programs as efficient as possible so the people who really, really need the services the most can get them and have the safety net available to them. But we're, we're going to have to be more careful with how the dollars are spent or it'll just eat our entire budget. Well, let, me just, let me just expand it real quickly because it's important. This isn't getting enough attention and it really is the issue that's demanding and, and you know, really a big player in our budget. In the last two-year Doyle budget, they used $1.8 billion of federal job stimulus dollars, 1.8 billion of federal job stimulus dollars to expand Medicare programs, Medicaid programs, excuse me, in Wisconsin. Not a penny of that money was available on day one of this new state budget that we're in. And what Representative Costell shared is that, you know, even though, you know, we're being castigated as these cold hearted evil people, we committed $1.2 billion of your state tax money to backfill that $1.8 billion hole that was one-time federal money. And every new penny that's coming into the state budget during this two-year period is going to that $1.2 billion investment that we're making in programs that help our fellow citizens. Um, on the news last night, there was a, a report about legislation on a minimum markup for pharmaceuticals that Wisconsin pays more for pharmaceuticals than a lot of other states because we have this minimum markup law. Um, where do all of you stand on that? Did I correctly depict that? I don't think anybody has correctly described the situation. It's it's a little more, it's a little less dramatic than people make it out to be, with uh, less impact than people would like you to, to uh, believe. It's a law that's been on the books since the 1930s. Anybody that's been in retail kind of knows about it. Not everybody pays that much attention to it. The first, the, what they were saying. Uh, up until recent times is that it was adding 15 cents a gallon of gas or something like that. Totally not true. Uh, if, you, if you talk to the folks that are in the, 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 the gas business, they'll tell you that 15 cents doesn't exist. So uh, whether or not it has the impact of what people believe or not, uh, it, the law, it, what we should do is not make that change based on bad information. But it should be, we should have all the information in front of us. I can tell you, uh, without going into a long explanation of, the, of why the, it, it may or may not be a good idea, a number of years ago, Minnesota eliminated that law and a couple years later re implemented based on the, the bad impact that happened 
to businesses in, in the in between time. So. <laughs> Any other questions? We probably have time for a little bit, but we have time for maybe one more question if you ha anybody has one. Right here. There's a follow up to the um, increase in spending. Do you think a lot of that has to do with the job situation? That more people are eligible for medical assistance because we don't have the jobs that we had four or five years ago? Well, first and foremost, it's due to the fact that. Again, with this one-time federal money, they actually expanded the eligibility opportunities for more people. So our income eligibility was raised in Wisconsin to be one of the highest in the nation. Um, and so, you know, they took one-time money, made all sorts of promises to a whole new group of people, and saying, now you too can be entitled to your government through this Medicaid entitlement program. And they did that knowing that none of that money was going to be available two years later. And I just want to kind of clarify or correct what you said. We didn't. Um, increased spending in Medicaid by 1.2, we backfilled the, the one-time federal money. We've actually had to make some tough votes, and we've actually had to vote to reduce Medicaid spending by $600 million just in the budget. Yeah, and I mean, none of that's easy, uh, but I think, again, we take pride in the fact that we were able to find $1.2 billion of new money to backfill that $1.8 billion hole. I've said this before, and you know, I, 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 we probably are self-serving, but it's true. Um, we have the best set of uh, legislative leaders of any county in the state of Wisconsin, and we're really thankful for that. So thank all of you. <laughs> One comment I did want to make, I forgot to, I think, give a thank you out. Um, you may have noticed the staging. That staging was provided by Windsor Industries. Is Charles here? No, he's not here. Yeah. Um, and so Charles Indust uh, uh, Windsor Industries makes, this is actually docking for docks and lakes. And <laughs> so he's got a multi-purpose uh, product here. So it's very nice and we thank him. And he, I think he's indicated he's going to let us use it for future events. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Dave. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.